I want to talk a little bit John Cheever, who writes one of the stories that we have for this week. Uh, in this case, we're reading the five. Uh, and so the focus of this nine slide show is to kind of give you an idea of the world in which this story exists. Um, Cheever is a writer whose reputation has kind of gone up and down over the years. Certainly when I first was reading him, he was one of the most famous writers in the United States. Um, but he has suffered somewhat uh, in the last few years because his stories tend to take place in a pretty narrow band. And I think some people um, are just sort of, what's the word I'm looking for, are not as interested in the kind of world that he talks about these days uh, as they were 40, 50 years ago. Cheever comes from the East, uh, from New York, Connecticut, New England, uh, from that area. But he spent most of his writing life uh, outside of New York City in, a, in Westchester County, one of the richest counties in the United States. And most of his stories take place in that area, stories that are not unlike the Blake Dent story that we're reading for, uh, for this week, because um, those are people who live in the suburbs but work in New York City. This is a picture of his study. And of course, this was taken in the 50s. He's a typewriter because computers hadn't been invented yet. I just thought you'd like to see what a writer's space can look like. Here's a little bit of facts about him. Uh, he died in 1982 when he was 70. Um, I should mention he was, a, he was an alcoholic. Uh, I thought people have this notion that writers are Alex because some part of a writer's life. And I often think that writers who are Alex drink because they're not writing. When they're writing, they don't drink. Hemingway is certainly the best example of that. That, well, he was writing when he was working on a novel or a short story. He never drank a drop. But in between times, uh, he would drink a great deal, I think because he found not writing difficult to live with. And, you know, I have no idea why writers do but uh, there is this kind of theory or this notion that, that writers, are, male writers and alcoholics, um, not because they're writers, it's because they're doing that when they're not writing. Um, it's also a, a bisexual children, um, but he had a very complex sexual life. And I think that was certainly not something that people talked about in the 50s and 60s, uh, but they do talk about it now. We have we've have his diaries, we have children, um, and they paint a an unattractive portrait of him, let me put it that way. Um, he never finished college, by the way. Uh, he was born and raised in Massachusetts, then rode in Ossining, New York, and I'll show you a map of just where that is. And it's just north of Manhattan. Ossining is the Shady Grove of the story, and he has set in Shady Grove, and they really are Ossining. Uh, it's a place I've been to many times because I used to live a cover from it. Um, as I say, Earlier, he kind of writes about a world that we don't think about very much. Upper and middle class, upper middle class people, you know, people who are pretty off. Um, he, he writes a lot about WASP, you know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, the traditional power holders in the United States in business and economics and politics. Um, these guys, because we live in a much more diverse culture now, they seem almost like cartoons uh, in some ways. They're like characters from a really early time. Um, in terms of affiliation, they tend to be Episcopalian, and that's because that was kind of the establishment church in the Northeast for a long time. Um, issues that come up uh, are old money versus new money. If you, if you made all your money in the last few years, let's say you made a zillion dollars in advertising market, you'd be looked down on by people who might have had money 50 years. They might have gotten it exactly the same that is through commerce. Um, but they would look down on you because you were no, new rich and they were old rich. And many times you'll see in Chiever, in the one that we're looking at for this week, some discussion of, of this conflict between old money. And money. Another issue that comes up is uh, different kind of codes. You know, is it okay to have an affair? Is it okay to have an affair if you're a man? Not okay if you're a woman. Um, is it okay to spend money in certain ways? Is it okay to deal with other people in certain ways um, in terms of your social standing? You know, who do you and who do you not invite to a party? How do you conduct yourself at a party? How do you not? It's a, it's a world that we don't spend a lot of time thinking about these days. This is something that pops up in his stories. That's a, kind of a nostalgia for a time where things were simpler or more clear cut or there's a nostalgia for a character's younger self or a younger past. Uh, in this particular story, I don't think you're going to see that, but you might. 
Um, one other point I want to make here that uh, Cheever is what's called a New Yorker writer, and there's kind of New Yorker school of fiction. It's still one of the magazines that publishes a, a lot of contemporary fiction. We have three or four stories uh, in the course from the New Yorkers you know from clicking the links. Um, and New Yorker stories tend to be short focused, uh, character driven, um, and extraordinarily written. They're usually the language that's used is, is on a little bit higher plane uh, than we might expect in, in other kinds of, of fiction, certainly the kind of fiction that we might see on television or on a streaming service like Netflix, um, compelling those, those, those might be. So New Yorker writers tend to write for a pretty sophisticated audience, uh, much like you guys, college students trying to get better. Uh, but he is kind of one of two or three consummate New Yorker writers that kind of established the notion of short stories for the New York as the, the high point of American culture, certainly in the time that they were writing. We don't really weigh as much anymore. This is a pretty crappy, this is the best picture I could find. And you can see how Ossining here is in the center. New is right down here. Yonkers is one of the immediate suburbs, you know, White Plain, Terrytown. This really is about 40 minutes by car from the center of Manhattan. I used to live up here, uh, Route 6 sign at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. And uh, I was in New York City every weekend um, when I was stationed there, all the eight years that we lived there, because um, it took about an hour. And New York City is just the most incredible place in the world. Um, this side of the the uh, west side is the more industrial. It's the more, um, you know, middle and lower class uh, in parts. The east side of the river, uh, which they call the English side, they call this the English side. If you live in that area, that's how you call it, uh, is the more expensive area. This is where the rich people live, all this large area of uh, this particular part of New York and, and uh, southern Connecticut. Most people commute to the city by train from these areas, and you can see how this is uh, southern New York and Connecticut over here. This is uh, the Harlem line uh, that goes up into uh, the heart of Westchester County and Putnam, and not Putnam, uh, Dutchess County right above it. And this is the right along the Hudson River. And Ossining is in the middle. Uh, the only reason I mention this is to give you some idea of just how complex this area is. There's literally about 20 million people within this uh, image. Uh, and that includes, of course, the people who live in New York City, which is down here at the bottom. And so the trains are really important because that's how you get to and from work, how you go to the city. That when you go to a Broadway show, this is how you come home, is you come home on the train. And that's why all Broadway shows run a certain amount of time, because they're fixed to how long it should get from a theater on Broadway to Grand Central or to Penn Station to take the last train back home. I am serious. So the 548 is the train. It take it, it goes at a certain time every day in the evening from New York, uh, and it passes through Austin. It stops there. Uh, I've taken that train many times. Here's a picture of Cheever next to the commuter train. Uh, he's actually at the station in Austin. I'll show you a picture of that. Um, and this is exactly what they look like. This is what Metro North looks like. I, I can't tell you how many times I've taken these. This is great. This is where all the all three of the lines, the Harlem Hudson and the um, all come this particular place. Literally a million people a day pass through this. It's one of the most interesting buildings. In I don't know exactly what it looks like now. This is an image I found that, of course, is pre-COVID. Uh, the building is old. It's one of the prettiest buildings in New York, I think. Um, and it's just a fascinating place go down to New York on a train. Sometimes I'd come back early and I'd be waiting for a train and I would go shopping in here. There's hundreds of stores. There's dozens of restaurants. There's an oyster bar. Um, it's just absolutely the most interesting place in the world. And all the tracks are underground. About three levels of train tracks underneath this that go you know, deeper and deeper into the earth. And that's where you go. Catch. This is on the ground level uh, is the information booth, the ticket booths are over here, the different waiting areas and restaurants, and then kind of about where you're sitting looking at this uh, is where the restaurants and the shops are. This is the Ossining train station. Uh, this is where Shady Grove uh, is, you know, the this is the inspiration for Shady Grove in the story. Um, this little shelter over here is new. This was built uh, in the 80s. Um, but this older part, this is the part that Blake and Dent actually pass through uh, in the course of the story. 
um, it's right on the edge of the town of Ossining. A lot of people do, in fact, uh, walk from their homes to the train station and back like Blake does. Um, other people drive because they live further out. But this is the actual train station that Blake and Dent uh, interact in the odd way that they do in this thing, just to give you an idea of what it looks like. And again, you got northbound and southbound trains, and you can't just walk across the tracks to go to one side or the other. So you've got to take one of these little overhead things. Uh, you don't see this on our Metro link, but you do see this if you ever go to take an Amtrak train. You'll walk across a bridge like this, depending on what direction you're going. If you're going towards Kansas City or you're going towards Chicago. This is the last slide. This is New York in the 1950s. And um, the reason that I want to spend a little bit of time here is that this is the world, the actual, these are pictures of the world where the short story exists. You can see, whoops. You can see this is Grand Central in the 50s. Not quite, it's from a little bit different angle uh, than the one that we saw, but here's the information booth in the middle. There's ticket booths over here. Uh, there's a restaurant up here. This was when there were a large number of military people in New York City at Governor's Island and also Brooklyn Navy Yard. And so there was an area set aside for service people. Um, some of the things to think about here is look at how people are dressed in the 50s, much more formally than we are now. Women are wearing skirts, they're wearing high heels, they're wearing stockings. Men wear suits and ties and hats. Uh, if we spent some time here, we'd probably see some women who wear hats, although not too many. Um, and New York's a very crowded place. I mean, there's literally, there's 8 million people who live there. The streets are almost always full, especially in the area that we're seeing here, which is Midtown Manhattan, you know, the area that you think about when we think about New York City. Um, but this is the world of Blake and Dent. Blake is the kind of guy that we see here in an overcoat and a suit and a hat. And Miss Dent is trying to fit in with these women. And so some of the things for you to think about is when we see a physical description of Miss Dent, for instance, we kind of have to put her in the uh, group of people who would be like her at the time, that is women who are dressed in a particular way. Um, when I lived in New York in the 80s, uh, when I was first stationed at West Point, um, more people were dressed more formally than when I was there in the 90s when I lived there the second time. Uh, and I think it's because we have a general kind of reduction of formality uh, in our own society. We also have a much more uh, complex definition of sexual and gender boundaries uh, in our own time than we did back then. In that time, men were men and they were expected to act a certain way and they could you know, sort of do things or say things that now we would regard as sexist or chauvinist. Um, women were definitely the subordinate characters, whether they were a wife or a secretary. Um, they were they were definitely subordinate to men socially. Uh, we see that in Blake's wife. Uh, we see that in Miss Dent. We see how he treats her in a particular way. We see how she treats herself. And so it's important when we're thinking about the story, when Miss Dent acts out of character, as she does at the end, think about this is the world that she comes from, where the boundaries are really pretty strict between men and women, and that men have certain uh, privileges that women simply do not. And so that when she does what she does at the end of the story, she's reacting against everything you're looking at in these two pictures, the strictures, the subordination, uh, the control of women that men had in this time. For those of you who watch Mad Men, you know, when that series was on, this is the world that Mad Men comes from. Of course, the Mad Men that we see on TV is a little bit later than these. It's in color. You know, these black and white pictures, I think, are evocative in a different way. But both that show and these photographs show you just how divided the two genders were. You know, and if you want to talk about, you know, gay people or trans people or any of those other things or African-Americans, they're not part of the picture here, are they? You can you can spend a lot of time with these photographs and not notice any people who aren't white. And it's not because New York was full of white people. It's because our society was a little bit more segregated back then than it is now. And the idea of a homosexual character or a trans character or a bisexual character, these would just not have been written about. It's not because they didn't exist. It's because writers didn't feel that there was an audience for that kind of fiction. Now, there was 
gay fiction, just to let you know, there's there was lesbian fiction that was all being written, but it wasn't mainstream, certainly not in the New Yorker and certainly not in Cheever's writing, even though he himself had some of those characteristics. Um, so when you're thinking about that, you're thinking about a world that's very different from our own, much more restrictive for women, much more uh, open for men in terms of what they could do and what they can't do. Okay, so this is just to give you a little bit of background into the story, the 548 that we're dealing with. I hope you like it.